Colossians chapter 1, verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I spent a long time today trying to come up with this title. This is going to be one of the most impressive titles you've ever heard in your life. The title of my message is Introduction to the Letter to the Colossians. Isn't that amazing? You just can't beat the titles that I come up with. Introduction to the Letter to the Colossians. We're, we're looking at Paul's introduction tonight, these first two verses. If we're not careful... When we read these letters, these epistles, and when you hear the word epistle, maybe you're new to the faith, you haven't been saved very long, you wonder, what does epistle mean? An epistle is a letter. It simply means a letter. And it's not, as one person said one time, an epistle, that's a female apostle. No, it's not. Um, it is a letter. It's a letter. And so we're reading the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Colossians. It's a letter. But if we're not careful, when we read these letters, all, all of the first few verses, especially Paul's epistles, they read so similar, if you're not careful, you'll just skim right through them and not consider what they say. And I think it's very important when we study the Word of God that even those most familiar verses, that we don't just skim through it and, and not meditate on what is being stated in those verses. When you're reading your Bible and you're going through John, just be honest, don't, you don't have to answer it out loud, but be honest, how quickly do you read through John chapter 3? How fast do you get past John 3, 16? When's the last time you, wrote, you read through the Gospel of John and just paused at John 3, 16? You probably didn't because you're so familiar with it. Now, you'll get a, to, to some verse where uh, you, you're, you're less familiar, little, the wording's a little harder, or maybe you're seeing something you've never seen before, and you'll pause there, and you'll meditate. Or maybe it's a verse that just speaks to your heart for that day, and you'll pause and meditate. But think about it. Those familiar passages, we tend to just skim right through. Every now and then, let's stop and look at the familiar passages and see what they say. And that's what we're going to do tonight concerning these first two verses of the book of Colossians. Notice real quickly Paul's authorship. The Apostle Paul is the author of the book of Colossians. Now, there are people in the scholarship realm who tried to debate that. They said, I just don't think Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. The way I look at it is, the Bible says Paul, I'm going with Paul. Amen, I'm going to take what the Bible says over any theologian, any scholar, any Bible professor at any point in time. What the Bible says is true. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 3, let God be true and every man a liar. The Bible says Paul, Paul is the author of the book of Colossians. The name Paul means little. The word Paul, in Greek it's Paulus, it means little. Which is interesting because, do you remember his name when he got saved, what he was called? Saul of Tarsus. His name was Saul. And I believe, more than likely, he was named after King Saul. King Saul of the Old Testament. King Saul of the Old Testament was of the tribe of Benjamin. We know that the Apostle Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So more than likely his parents named him after King Saul. And King Saul was known for being head and shoulders above everybody else. So here's the Apostle Paul originally being named after probably the biggest king Israel ever had. Let, let's name our son after the, the, the large king, the big king. In fact, God told Saul, you were doing good while you were little in your own sight. But when the apostle, excuse me, when King Saul saw himself head and shoulders above everybody else, that's when his kingdom came tumbling down. And maybe that was a motivating factor in Paul taking on the name of Paul later on in the book of Acts. I'm not sure if he always had both names. He could have. Because he was also a Roman citizen, it could be he had a Jewish name, Saul, and a Roman name of Paul. He could have had both names for that purpose. Or it could simply be he decided to change his name. We don't know which one 
But regardless, he went from a name that linked him to the guy head and shoulders above everybody else, and he decided to go by the name Paul, which means little. John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He must increase. I think the Apostle Paul got that spirit in him. As he grew in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, he realized, I need to be little, and Jesus needs to be great. But the Apostle Paul is the author. That I would recommend that be your experience as well in your Christian life. Let the Lord increase in your life. You decrease. Let's decrease. Let's not see ourselves to the level of importance that we tend to see ourselves. Let me remind you tonight, we're all expendable. Every one of us are replaceable. If I drop dead today, Kelly can find a better man tomorrow. If this is my last day on earth, you can find a better preacher tomorrow. We're all expendable. We need God. He does not need us. So humble yourself. Cease trying to be a Saul. I want to be head and shoulders above everybody else and be a Paul and see yourself as little, as little. Now, Paul's epistles, his letters are very important. In fact, I would even say that in your Bible, and when you do Bible study, I would say that Paul's epistles are the priority of your understanding the Word of God. And there's a group out there called hyper-dispensationalists. Don't worry about the term. I'm not one, so don't worry about it. But there's a group called hyper-dispensationalists. And what they do is they emphasize the Apostle Paul to the extent that they say that none of the rest of the Scriptures have anything to do with us or do we need to spend time in those books, because they're not for us. I don't agree with that. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. All of the Bible is for us. It may not all have been to us, but it is all for us. However, I will say this, that I believe that the best way to study your Bible is to know what the Apostle Paul says in his letters, from Romans to Philemon. I, I, I disregard Hebrews in this case. I do believe that's a Pauline epistle, but it doesn't bear his name, and I believe that God, that God did that on purpose to distinguish it from Romans to Philemon. When you are familiar with Romans to Philemon, you get your theology from the Apostle Paul, it helps you balance the rest of the Scriptures. In fact, I believe Paul's books are, if I can use this term, dispensationally located in in the Bible. I believe God put these books, where where they are in the Bible, on purpose. You you have the book of Acts. That's That's the last book of the Bible right before you get to Paul's epistles. In the book of Acts, God is still dealing with the nation of Israel, especially in the early part of the book of Acts. He transitions in that book and begins to deal with the Gentiles. But when you get to Acts 28, the book of Acts ends with a judgment on the nation of Israel. And just a few years after Acts 28, the nation of Israel is ransacked and destroyed by the Roman army in a a three-and-a-half-year war from 67 A.D. to 70 A.D. So you have the book of Acts which they transition from Jew to Gentile, but it ends with a judgment on the Jewish people. And then you go into Romans. There's Paul's business. But then when you get to the end of Philemon, what's the first book after Philemon? Hebrews. We're back to looking at the Jews again. And then you have James. And then you have 1st, 2nd Peter. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Jude, Revelation. I don't know if you're aware of this, but those epistles and those authors, except with the exception of Jude, I'll say something about that in just a moment, but those authors, James and Peter and John, their primary mission work and ministry was to the Jewish people. I can prove it to you. Take your Bible, go to Galatians real quickly. Go to Galatians. 
just showing you why the, the, the Apostle Paul's books are placed in your Bible, where they're placed. Look in uh, Galatians chapter number 2. And look at verse number 9. Paul makes this statement in Galatians 2 verse 9. And when James, Cephas, y'all know who Cephas is? That's Peter, the Apostle Peter. When James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship, that we, Paul and Barnabas, should go unto the heathen, the Gentiles, and they, that's James, Peter, and John, unto the circumcision, that's the Jewish people. Everybody see that? Now here's what's interesting about that verse. Well, there's many things interesting about that verse. There's one thing I want to point out. Here he says, James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, their ministry is primarily to the circumcision. That doesn't mean that they never witnessed to a Gentile. Of course they did. And it's not saying that Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas never witnessed to a Jew. Every town Paul went to, he went to the synagogue first. But his primary ministry was to the Gentile. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. But you see the, the triplet here, the names of James, Cephas, and John. You'll find those three names together at the same time in multiple verses in the Bible. Multiple verses. All through the New Testament, you'll find James, Peter, and John. But in every single verse in the New Testament, you can go look at it yourself. Every single verse in the New Testament where those three are listed together, Peter's always first. Peter's always named first. Except here. And it was when the Apostle Paul says their ministry is to the Jewish people. And it just so happens the order of the names of those three men in this verse is the exact order that those books of the Bible by those men come in the New Testament. James, then Peter's books, and then John's books. The only time you see their names misarranged like this and Peter's not first is in the verse that says, James, Peter, and John are to the Jews. So I believe what he's saying is, Romans to Philemon, that's primarily our epistles. Don't misunderstand me. We, we can live in Hebrews. I cannot wait to preach through Hebrews. I'm chomping at the bit. We, we gain and we glean from James and we glean from First and Second Peter and John's epistles in the book of Revelation. I believe Jude was placed there in its spot because I believe Jude is describing the way the church is and the conditions of the church right before the book of Revelation takes place. Jude describes what Colossians is trying to prevent. Laodicea, the false prophets and the false preachers that are growing by leaps and bounds in these days. But what that says is to me is Romans to Philemon, these are our epistles, the church epistles. Then you have Hebrews, which begins the general epistles, and some people even call them the Jewish epistles, where James and Peter and John primarily deal with the Jewish people. I say all that to say this. The Apostle Paul is the primary, his books are the primary place where we get our theology and our doctrine. In other words, when you're studying in Leviticus or you're studying even in Matthew or you're studying in James, you balance all of that with the Apostle Paul. Let me illustrate it for you. Many of you have run across James chapter 2 where James says, James says in James 2, Brother Mike Adams, you've been around a good while in the church. You've heard about James 2 where James says we're justified by works. You've come across that verse. If all you had was James, and James says in James 2, you're justified by works. If all you had was James, you know what we'd all believe? Well, I better get to work and justify myself. You know why we know that's not what James is saying? Paul. Because you have Romans, you know what James is saying. I'm not going to discuss James tonight. We'll deal with that eventually. But we know what James is saying because we have the Apostle Paul. 
So no matter where you read in the scriptures, you balance it with the Apostle Paul. In Matthew chapter number 10, Jesus said, only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles and don't go to the Samaritans. Well, that don't sound like Paul, but that's the words of Christ. It's red letters in your Bible. These are red letters. But it doesn't agree with Paul. Jesus was speaking for a particular time, a particular ministry, prior to the cross, prior to the resurrection. We balance our study of the scriptures with the Apostle Paul. In fact, I came up with a little saying years ago at the first church I pastored. I wanted to come up with something that would help people memorize this, that if you learn the epistles of Paul, it would help you balance yourself in your theology, no matter where you're reading. So no matter where you're reading, whether it's Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to Acts, or Hebrews to Revelation, if it agrees with Paul, it's for you. If it disagrees with Paul, it's for the Jew. If you'll keep that in mind, no matter where you're reading in the Bible, if it agrees with Paul, it applies to you. If it disagrees with Paul, there are places that disagree with Paul. You say, so where? Read the Old Testament sacrifices. They don't agree with Paul. That applied to the Jew. But we use the Apostle Paul in his letters to help us balance out our study. Notice the Apostle Paul's apostleship. Let's go back to Colossians 1, please. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle literally means, simply means, sent one. So in a sense, we're, we're all apostolic. Be careful with that. But we're all sent. We're all sent. But the position of apostle, the, the, the term apostle, was a specific office of the early church that Jesus Christ selected a few men to hold that office. And it was an office of great authority. In fact, this office even held above the pastors of the churches at the time because the New Testament was still being developed at the time. Because theology was still being learned and, and grown and, and revealed through the New Testament writings, the apostles were used to, to go to, from church to church and teach and write and tell us what God said was true. The apostles. Now, you may run across somebody here in Louisiana that still thinks they are an apostle. They may even have the name on the sign, Apostle so-and-so. Pastor's here. Well, unfortunately for that individual, the apostles are gone. There are no more apostles. In fact, uh, take your Bible to Ephesians 2 real quick. Let me show you a verse. I can say more about this. Let me just give you this one, uh, one or two verses here, and uh, that'll sum up this, this situation of do apostles still exist today? In Ephesians 2, verse number 19, the Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now look at verse 20, Ephesians 2, verse 20. And are built, we as the saints of God, the church, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, we have, a, we have a number of men in here, maybe some ladies, that are builders. You, you, you've built things. Brother Jim Adams has been involved for ages in building buildings. We have many men in here that you know what that is. You know what you're doing when you're building a building. And you lay that foundation. But when you lay that foundation, you lay it one time. You don't lay it again. If you have to lay it again, that means you messed up the first time. Something messed up. God don't mess up in His foundation. There's nothing wrong with His foundation. He laid it one time. So you lay a foundation one time, and everything else is built upon the foundation. 
So if the apostles and the prophets were the foundation, they were laid one time. We don't still need the apostles and the prophets. They were laid one time. And since then, we've all built upon the apostles and the prophets. That's why we don't have offices today for apostles and prophets. Amen. That you go to 1 Timothy and look at the qualifications, or Titus 1, of the qualifications of, of men that work in the church, the pastors and the deacons, you won't find qualifications for the apostles or the prophets. You know why? We don't need the apostles and the prophets anymore. We don't need them. They're gone. So if you see someone call himself apostle, you're just as much a, as an apostle as they are. But that was a specific authoritative office for the early church. Notice real quickly Paul's acceptance. I don't want to belabor this point, but it is a very important point. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's sent as an authoritative figure in the church to teach theology and doctrine and the things of God. But his acceptance of this, he said, it's by the will of God. He said, I'm doing this by the will of God. I have accepted what God's plan for my life is. By the will of God. I want to ask you this question tonight. Can you say along with the Apostle Paul, I am doing what I am doing, I am what I am, by the will of God. See, the will of God is not just for preachers. It's not just for apostles in the scriptures. It's not just for deacons or Sunday school teachers or evangelists or missionaries across the world. The will of God is for everybody. God has a will for your life. The word will means desire. He has a desire for your life. God wants to use you. He wants to use your gifts, your talents. He wants to use you from, through the experiences that you've had in life to be a blessing to somebody else, to be a blessing in the ministry. Are you doing the will of God? Have you accepted, hey young people, have you accepted God's will for your life? God's will. I've seen many times, I just want to know what God wants me to do. And what they're saying is, 10 years from now, I want to know what God wants me to do. 20 years from now, I want to know where God wants me to be. The best way to know what God wants you to do 10 years from now is do what you know God wants you to do today. You do God's will today because you all, we all know what God wants us to do today. He wants you to pray. He wants you to read His Bible. He wants you to come to church. He wants you to give tithes and offerings. He wants you to tell somebody else about Christ. He wants you to live holy, not be in love with the world. You know what God wants you to do. You do those things, and God will begin to fill in all the blanks Amen. of His will. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He'll do what? That's, your, that's God's will, directing your path. He'll direct your path. Notice real quickly, Paul's associate in Timotheus, our brother. That's not pronounced Timotheus. It's Timotheus. Timotheus, our brother. You're not sinning against God if you say Timotheus. I'm just letting you know it's pronounced Timotheus. Timothy was a close, close companion of the Apostle Paul. His father was a Greek. His mother was a Jew. And through the influence of his mother and grandmother, we know this in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, that uh, he come to, the, to know the Lord as his Savior. And he became a servant and a, a companion, a helper to the Apostle Paul as a father works with a son. And I'm just glad to know that if, if the Apostle Paul needed somebody to come alongside him and help him, that ought to encourage us when we want to try to do it on our own and we think we're supposed to do it on our own, I'm glad we don't have to do God's will on our own. God always sends somebody along to help. It's wonderful when I see a missionary going to help another missionary or two missionaries going together to be partners in that ministry. There's such an encouragement. Jesus even sent them out two by two, the Bible says. Y'all thank God for your church.
We don't have to do this by ourselves. You don't have to live for God by yourself. You don't have to figure out victory by yourself. You get to come to church and be around God's people and be in this atmosphere and be influenced by others and, and ask somebody, will you please pray for me? I'm dealing with this. We get to do this together. Praise the Lord. And that's what I see here. The Apostle Paul said, I've got my associate here, my, my partner here that helps me in the ministry. But then notice Paul's audience. Verse 2, he says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. And the city of Colossae is located in what we know now as Turkey. Once, as, once known as Asia Minor is today known as the country of Turkey. Now, we're not sure who founded, who was the church planner that started the church at Colossae. I was listening to Mike Bagwell teach on this book, and he, he leans toward Epaphras. We're, we're going to run into Epaphras in verse number 7 and other portions of this book as well. It could have been Epaphras that, that started the church, and, and uh, some lean toward Epaphras being the starter, the founder of the church, but maybe Archippus, the pastor. In the very last chapter of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 17, Paul says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. So it could be the Archippus is actually the pastor now of the church at Colossae. We also know, if you take your Bible, go to Philemon. We also know that the church at Colossae met in the house of Philemon. The Bible says in Philemon, Verse number one, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved uh, at Phia and Archippus, our fellow laborer, and to the church in thy house. So there's Archippus, the, the, possibly the pastor, and the church in his house. The church of Colossae met at Philemon's house. Philemon was a wealthy man. We know that because he owned servants. One of those servants was named Onesimus. We'll see more about Onesimus as we go through the book of Colossians. But here's the church at Colossae, possibly started by Epaphras, pastored possibly by Archippus, and certainly meeting in the house of Philemon. I wonder if you've had you, you ever made that connection between Philemon and Colossae. When Tychicus, I love Tychicus, I can't wait to talk about Tychicus, he carried the book of Colossians and Philemon with Onesimus. Remember, Onesimus goes to see Paul in prison, runs into it, hears about it, meets it. Paul's in the house prison. Paul leads Onesimus to the Lord. Onesimus is an escaped prisoner. He is possibly stolen from Philemon. Philemon could have had Onesimus killed. Onesimus comes in contact with the Apostle Paul. Paul wins him to the Lord. Now Paul's telling him, you got to go back to Philemon. you got to get right. But if he sends Onesimus to Philemon... And here's Philemon, though he's a Christian man, a good man, has a church in his house. He still may have some natural anger. And if he saw Onesimus coming up the road, even though Onesimus may have the letter to Philemon, written by the Apostle Paul saying, accept Onesimus as your brother now, as a faithful servant. Don't chop his head off, don't have him killed. Well, by the time Philemon read the letter, he may have already killed Onesimus. So he sends the faithful Tychicus alongside of Onesimus. And now when Onesimus comes down the road, here comes Tychicus carrying Philemon, the letter to Philemon, and the letter to Colossians. That man has some valuable documents in his hands. But he carries those two documents. And he comes to Philemon. Philemon sees Onesimus. He could have just killed or had Onesimus killed. But when he sees Tychicus with Onesimus, he's not just going to kill Onesimus. Tychicus was used to save Onesimus' life.
Antiochus brings the letters of Colossians and Philemon to Philemon and to that church with Onesimus by his side. I see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ there. We were the thieves. We were the ones that deserved to die. But Jesus comes before the Father and says, here's my word, here's my promise to them and to you. And I've paid for their sins. And we, Onesimus, we're received into the home, into the house of God because of our great Tychicus, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't wait to talk about Tychicus. I love Tychicus. We'll get to that eventually. I thought I'd whet your appetite with that. But they met in Philemon's house. But the Bible says, Paul says, go back to Colossians, please. In the book of Colossians, Paul says that Epaphras had visited the Apostle Paul in prison. Obviously, Epaphras lets Paul know of some situations going on in Colossae that they're dealing with. So Paul writes the book of Colossians to counteract the conflicts that they're having. We'll get into that as we study the letter. But let me close with this, Paul's affection. In the last part of verse number 2, Grace be unto you, he says, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those words are so easy just to gloss over because Paul says it in every one of his epistles. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. But let me remind you tonight that those are the two things you and I desperately need tonight. We need the grace of God and we need the peace of God that only God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ gives. Now it is interesting. From Romans all the way to 2 Thessalonians and Philemon. Every one of those epistles, it's grace and peace, grace and peace. Three of Paul's epistles, he adds one extra word. And it's in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Those are the books we call the pastoral epistles. And in those epistles, he says grace, peace, then he adds mercy. When he wrote to the pastors, he said mercy. Because evidently he knew, pastor and Baptist, we're going to need some mercy. But in all of his epistles, he said grace and peace. And that's what God desires for Fundamental Baptist Church tonight. We need his grace. We cannot do this on our own, and we don't deserve it. But we need his peace. We need to learn to rest in Jesus Christ. Me and Brother Clint were talking yesterday in the car. He and Sheena ran into it. I'll close with this. He and Sheena ran into some ladies at the store the other day who are part of some heretical denomination. They weren't Seventh-day Adventists. They were some other denomination, but, but they have some similarities to the Seventh-day Adventists, and one of those is going to church on Saturdays. So let's go to church on Saturday, the Sabbath. And so that stirred up a little sermon in me, and I shared it with Brother Clint. I'm going to share it with you tonight that the Sabbath today is not a day on your calendar. The Sabbath is not a day on your calendar. The Sabbath is a person. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. In the Old Testament, the Sabbath was one day a week. In the New Testament, it's something you and I get to experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, and an extra one on leap year. We get the rest that comes. Our Sabbath is Jesus Christ. He fulfilled all of those days. In fact, in Colossians 2, the Apostle Paul deals with this. We'll deal with it when we get there. Those holy days, those new moons, those Sabbaths, he says those are Jesus Christ. Christ fulfilled all of those. So what we need today, fundamental, don't misunderstand me. We need a day of rest. We need that one day where we come together. We need that. But your Sabbath, your peace is Jesus Christ. It's not a day on your calendar. It's Him. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. Maybe even this week you've labored and you've been heavy laden. He says, come to me. I will give you rest.